first thing that I, I want people to understand, uh, and just if you can just believe that, that we're all programmed to live a certain amount of time, and you pick a number. Maybe we're programmed to be 90 years old. And then things get in the way, and we may not reach that 90. But what we're really talking about when I'm talking about living is really living, to be able to be functional, to be able to do what you want to do, and to be able to do this for as long a time as you can. So in orthopedics, I deal with muscle skeletal problems, and we're mostly concerned with function. My bias happens to be sports medicine, and it's a part of orthopedics. And it comes from really all my uh, training. I, I was a fairly fanatic athlete, and I, I watch my body decay. Uh, it's not pleasant, but there are ways uh, that you can get around it. And that's what uh, ultimately I'm going to try to communicate. Um, it may involve, instead of playing shortstop, it may be converting to second base, and then to first base, and then joining an older league but you still can have some of the thrill of sports and feel much uh, more viable. Uh, some of the things that we can uh, do, uh, certainly exercise is very important. Large alcohol consumption uh, is not recommended. Avoiding smoking, um, that we all know, uh, and then become medical stabilized. And I think the previous lecturers, if you have diabetes or heart uh, problems or a high hypertension, this you want to take uh, care of. Last thing, and we'll really get into this, losing weight just on diet is, is just not good enough. And one of the reasons it's not good enough is it doesn't last. When we're dealing with um, osteoarthritis uh, of the knee, and this is the major arthritis that people uh, will have, there's no question that there is uh, heredity uh, involved in this. Uh, you can have families uh, that you can see brothers and sisters, uh, they all have arthritis at very young age and uh, require uh, much more treatment. And I understand that weight has been pounded into you and it's going to be pounded again. Weight, from a very simplistic view, it just puts more pressure uh, on the uh, joints. But what we're finding out um, with uh, obesity that it's not just a weight thing. There seems to be uh, certain hormones that change things. One example, women who are much more uh, prone to arthritis, why do heavy women have problems with uh, arthritis of their hands? This is not weight bearing, why? Then of course trauma leads to uh, arthritis. If you've had an accident or a fracture that goes into the joint, there's no question that um, there will be increased um, arthritis. Repetitive injuries. If you happen to use a hammer constantly, you're going to have problems with that wrist or that elbow. High impact sports, we all know, uh, whether it be uh, football um, or something of that nature, uh, people really get injured. And uh, certainly there are certain diseases which uh, seem to be prone to the joints, which then uh, alter things. So you want to know what you can do to, be, to live longer or at least you know, live a, a lifestyle that you would prefer. And so the first thing is lifestyle changes. And the biggest uh, thing as a starting point is going to be uh, diet. To continue to be very overweight uh, um, is, is now uh, not acceptable uh, for uh, good health. Uh, and the only way you can maintain this is not only a weight loss program, uh, but combined with um, exercise. If you would just ask, uh, if you could ask your parents or remember what your parents would feed you or your grandparents, it was always a, a square meal. Square meaning you had different colors on your plate. You had, uh, had to have some vegetable, you had to have some meat and some starch. And we've gone away from that and, you know, everything comes around full circle and we're much closer to coming back to that. Some sobering things. In the United States, 33% of people are overweight and 22% are obese. And, and the way this is, they call this a BMI, a body mass index, and the way that's uh, basically figured out is uh, kilograms, weight in kilograms over height in meters. Normal is up to about 25, overweight uh, is uh, beyond 30, 
and obese is over uh, 35. The other thing uh, of concern is waist circumference, and they find that this is a cardiac risk as well. Men with uh, 40 inch and women uh, 35 inch um, presents problem in its cardiac risk. From 1994 to 2008, uh, this just shows the huge change in the amount of obesity in the United States. But even worse than that is child obesity. Looking at some of these statistics, and, and this was one for different countries, I was always the impression, oh, it's just America that's fat. But this whole world is, is uh, really heavy. Implications of obesity, we've touched on a lot of these. You know, what's so, if you're a little heavy, what it, does it mean? I think we're learning more and more uh, that uh, you will have increased coronary disease, hypertension, gallbladder, diabetes, gout. Again, we know these things. We find it, uh, the, again, muscle skeletal conditions, stroke, and even cancer. So there are some things that are mediating in your system with fat, which goes beyond just you know, a big house and small foundation. It's not that simple. But now, finally, some good news. The loss of 11 pounds uh, noted that there was a decrease in the amount of your arthritic pains by 50% within 10 years. So the weight loss really can make a, a difference. And the third thing is what I was talking about, the horm hormonal or uh, lipocytokines. Some of these things we're just learning what they uh, do. If you go away with a few things, obesity to me is the, the new cigarette. What has happened, though, that we have found that cigarette smoking is not just a, a cause of emphysema or cancer of the lungs, but it causes so many other uh, cancers, so many other things. And in orthopedics, healing of fractures, tremendously limited uh, by smoking. So this already we know, we're becoming used to all of this news. And uh, my understanding is that obesity is going to be the same thing. It's not just about the obvious heart disease or diabetes. We're going to see this causes so many more problems. When we talk about activities, that doesn't mean that I'm asking you to play baseball or soccer or do anything like that. Little things uh, make a difference. Walking upstairs. Um, I, I would put a big sign that uh, you're not allowed to use an elevator on, unless you're handicapped. Because after uh, a period of time during the day, you will have walked many, many stairs. And I, I have a slide here that shows uh, the caloric expenditure, and it's amazing. We're really talking about low uh, impact activities, um, as, as certainly as a start, whether it be walking, or golf, water aerobics, um, tai Chi, the gentle calisthenics, uh, some of these uh, activities that are just a little bit more uh, vigorous. You know, you don't have to play ball. Gardening, 49 calories in 10 minutes. Climbing stairs, 175 calories per, uh, 10, in 10 minutes. I think you have to trick yourself a, a little bit. What I've done, and I found this very, very helpful, is that um, I have a stationary uh, bicycle and I use that uh, to watch some TV when I, oh, I have to watch a ball game or something like that. And you're watching it and all of a sudden you've, you know, turned your uh, bicycle, uh, the wheels, and it's been an hour or an hour and a half. And here are some other things which are of interest. Again, uh, gardening is the one that uh, surprised me. And it's exhausting. You know, if you're really uh, shoveling uh, manure or uh, compost or whatever you're uh, doing and, and reaching and, and digging, uh, there's a lot of activity if you're doing it seriously. I, I think activity, um, you, you must reflect on it and see how you can become more active. And that's assuming that, you know, all limbs are okay, that, uh, that they work and, and different, different medical conditions are taken care of. And if not, then there are ways to take care of these things. And there are um, certain things that we have in orthopedics to make you better. Uh, now the pharmacology, uh, some things about what uh, medications or drugs uh, may be helpful. My bias is to try to take as little medication as possible. Having said that, 
then now I'll tell you about the medications that you really need in terms of anti-inflammatories. Anti-inflammatories you can get over the counter, the ibuprofens, the naprosins, they all have risks. Um, Tylenol is not an anti-inflammatory, it's just a, a pain medication, but that has risks as well, especially when you take a lot of them. Uh, some of the newer, the COX-2 uh, uh, anti-inflammatories such as Celebrex, um, there was some concern if there was a problem with that. Um, this along with uh, something called Viox previously, which worked great, but there were risks. Celebrex uh, does not have that risks, and um, it probably has risk, less risks than ibuprofen um, or naproxen, but it's expensive. But for those people uh, that need it uh, for back or knee or hip pain, it's a godsend. But use it sparingly. The next thing which is now really uh, quite new, it's been here for several years, but it's uh, gaining, is something uh, called visco supplementation injections. These generally are from three to five injections. And they, they actually um, serve almost like uh, lubricating your joint. It's hyaluron's, which is the, our word for it, and it seems to serve as uh, lubrication and seems to help with wear in the uh, joint. We've never had anything like that, and for some people, it's uh, very helpful. Ideally, you want a joint that's clean of debris before you do that, although you don't have to. In other words, an analogy is to changing your oil. You don't want to keep adding oil. At some point, you should remove all the oil, and if you've ever seen oil that's removed, it's really very gritty. Well, that's the same thing that happens with early and slowly progressive arthritis in the joint. There's a lot of grit uh, that's actually in the joint surface. Um, sometimes uh, we would do an arthros arthroscopic clean-out where we, we clean out all this debris and then at a later time inject this uh, thick oil-like substance. And what it, it seems to uh, do is it, it changes uh, the milieu, the, uh, the surroundings of the joint. When you're very young, uh, it's, it's just like very thick honey. And as you get older and arthritic, it becomes thinner and thinner. These injections, they are seen to last sometimes six months, sometimes the ones we've given much, much longer. It's only approved uh, for knees at this point. The most popular are Synvisc and Euflexa. The difference is Euflexa is kind of man-made from uh, bacteria and there's very little side effects. Synvisc, it's made out of a rooster's comb and uh, there can be uh, some uh, allergic symptoms. The others are, at least in this area, less uh, used, but orthovisc, suparts, and hyaligan. You can see the ones that are closest to the healthy knee are euflexa and synvisc. So now we have some arthritis. We've maybe tried some anti-inflammatories. We've tried to uh, strengthen our muscles uh, to uh, overcome any joint stress. And that's very important. The, thing, the one thing that can control the joint is your uh, muscles. And so if you strengthen your muscles, it can provide tremendous relief. Some people that have just knee pain and they don't want this, they don't want that, if you get them on an exercise program, strengthen the muscles, somehow they feel better. And it, it's true. So what we c can we do? We can. Uh, if we failed with the conservative uh, treatment, which is first exercise, diet control, some anti-inflammatories, maybe this visco supplementation, then we can do uh, the microsurgery. Now, that, this is arthroscopy. These are arthroscopes, so you can look through and you can see something. You know, you'll, this is generally placed on a, a camera, so it's like this. So when I'm operating, I'm, I'm just, you know, looking like this. I'm looking at a, it's a big screen that we have. Um, and then we generally use a tool that's placed in here, and, and this is one of the tools. It's like a, 
a little burr drill or something like a rotor rooter we, we nickname it. So I'm going to pass this around just to get a feel for it. And you can look through it. So the idea of uh, this is that you can place through a tiny uh, puncture, you can actually uh, view the inside of a knee. And it's blown up. I guess our screen is about this size. So any little defect uh, shows a very large defect. It's generally a minimally invasive kind of procedure. Uh, it generally takes a half hour, 45 minutes. Generally, it's not that painful, although it depends on how much is done and how much damage you have. And it may not be curative. If you're dealing with a very arthritic uh, problem, uh, that you, it's not going to cure your arthritis. It's going to clean up the debris. And, and then at a later time, it may be uh, worth uh, going in and having this visco supplementation on top of it. You've cleaned out the dirty oil, now put in some fresh oil. And again, the response varies. Uh, some people uh, can have years of uh, help and some uh, not much. But these are options. Then, uh, if this doesn't work, then um, we go generally uh, surgically to uh, joint replacements. Uh, now many of the joints uh, can be replaced. The best ones uh, in the longest track records are hips and knees. Ankles are not that uh, good. They don't seem to last a long time and complications um, can be considerable. Total elbows uh, also not uh, great. But with a total hip, here is a, a picture. Uh, you see the uh, pink. And you know, everything should be nice and smooth. The hip is a ball and it fits into a socket. This is the actually ball of the hip and this would fit into a socket. So when you're uh, doing a, a hip replacement, you have to, uh, it's called a total hip because you're replacing the hip and the actual socket. So we would remove actually this part of the hip so here, very quickly, uh, we're taking off this head. We're, we're smoothing out the, the socket. And then we put in, generally, a cup, a liner, and then the head. And this head, and I have this demonstrated, this actually goes into uh, the marrow cavity. So you have to drill that. And then this gets inserted here. So this forms into the femur. So if this is, this is the one that went in, then this puts a cap. And they have now uh, greater and greater ceramics and things, which is a, a modulus of elasticity. It's, equal, it's, it's mimicking bone very closely. And if you just feel it, you'll feel that there's virtually no friction. And this is one of the kind uh, they can either be cemented in, this could be cemented into this shaft, or it can be without cement. Now we're tending to go without cement and let the bone, you'll see, and we'll pass some of these things around, you'll feel it's like sandpaper. And that's for the bone, we call it interdigitate, to, to try to really grasp and get a hold of it. In the history of this, they found that it, it can't just be hard, it, it, it must not be brittle. So they've altered these things. So it's harder than real life and less brittle as well. And then ultimately, this is the way a hip would look. There are some complications, certainly, uh, with hip replacements. There's the usual complications that can occur with uh, any surgery, infection, or uh, certainly blood clots. Uh, but uh, with hips particularly, it's the concern about dislocation. And uh, it, sometimes it can be the way the prosthesis is actually placed in, and then sometimes at a much later time, it's your body changes and there can be alteration of your muscle structure. Now uh, for total knees, here again, uh, the difference is that almost all the total knees are cemented. And here we, we see a smoothness. And then what happens when there is irritation to the joint, the, 
it's almost like you would put acid on it and the, the joint, it starts to deteriorate. And what the body is trying to do is it, it feels your pain and is trying to create a bigger surface area and by a bigger surface area, take away some of the stress. And so then spurs start to form, we call them osteophytes, and your knees start to get wider and, and bigger. And this is just, a, again, one is nice and one is a bit eroded. And then this is a, a total joint that's placed. Now, a total joint for a, a knee comprises the tibia, the femur, and then there's the kneecap. This is uh, fit in and it's cemented. So this was good, it's tight. That's the way it's meant to be. This is the femur. And then this is fit and this is the uh, tibia. So that when you move it, you move uh, like that. And then the kneecap actually slides into this groove. People think that what we remove is a big chunk of bone. And it's not, it's just a, it's just a real veneer of the bone. It's just a very thin a slice of the cartilage uh, so that you can then put those metal bases on that you see. Uh, now, what are the problems with knees? Uh, you can start weight bearing immediately on knees. You have very, very rarely uh, dislocations. That's not really a problem. The biggest problem is to gain motion. And uh, the biggest problems really occur with, uh, with women because it's uh, the misfortune that uh, women's weight uh, is very often in uh, knees, thighs, and hips. With men, basically they have big bellies and they still have thin knees. And so this is a problem with getting a range of motion. Uh, and it is difficult. And so the, the therapy involved uh, with uh, knees are, uh, it's arduous and really takes, uh, you know, a, a lot of uh, work uh, on the patient's part. If I can just leave you with uh, a certain uh, things, I, I think you really, we all have to work uh, on our uh, diet. And it, it can't be something that's onerous. It has to be something that's reasonably pleasurable. Go to the library, take out the book on South Beach Diet. It's a diet which uh, is a lifestyle change. And exercise is the other thing. It, you can trick yourself into doing exercise in many easy ways. If you have a, a bicycle that you don't use, you can just uh, rig it up so that the, the wheels don't touch the ground and, and you can use that. Use it when you're reading a book, watching TV, and all of a sudden, boom, a thousand calories, boom. And, and and it'll start to, uh, the weight will start to fall and everything then uh, will improve. Any questions, relevant or irrelevant? Yeah, I'd like to, um, when you cut the femur and put that uh, metal, metal thing in there to attach to the hip, what happens with the marrow? Does it affect that? Good question. Um, evidently you can, uh, but uh, what you do, you, you're drilling a hole through there and you have the, other parts of your body uh, that have marrow which will create the blood. In other words, your, your pelvis is the big um, marrow producer that uh, produces your blood and things of that nature. And uh, when this, when you drill down, you've drilled just this much, you still have all the marrow uh, that's down there. And, and what it happens, it will increase Great question. I've not ever been asked that. But yeah, it's your iliac, uh, your pelvis. What do you do about um, tendonitis from repetitive activity? Do you, and, and in conjunction with exercise, do you, do you stop lifting weights? Do you lift less? Do you just let it rest until the tendonitis clears up? I, I would always say not to stop anything. It's only if it's uh, our really very um, uh, flagrant that you should stop it, but you should definitely alter it. Whatever that particular exercise is, change it. Go, if you're doing, say, if it's a little curl and you're doing it with 10 pounds, just do it with one pound, just to keep motion. Motion will help, exertion will hurt. So if you already have a tendonitis, and the most 
famous probably is a, a, like a tennis elbow or something like that. That you have to quiet down the symptoms. Still move your arm, but say ice it, brace it. Um, ultimately, anti-inflammatories can be helpful. Physical therapy can be helpful. Here in Margaretville, you have a great physical therapy. I mean, really uh, beyond uh, what you would expect in such a small town. So that you can make use of. Sometimes cortisone injections are helpful. You have to be a little careful of cortisone with tendinitis. You can't give it too frequently. And certain tendinitis is um, only rarely. One thing I didn't mention, which is of course the most important thing, is warm up. Warm up uh, uh, for everyone is very important. And as we get older, it's even more important. And the worst thing you can do if you're a golfer is just to uh, run out uh, to the first hole straight from the car and never do anything. And I see I have a spy there that knows that's exactly what I wind up doing. And so my first nine is always terrible, and by the time I warm up, the second nine is, is good. Warm up means to, to get to, uh, like you're just about to perspire. So if you happen to be a runner, People go, they start to run, that's not appropriate. And you, what you need to do is do some gentle exercises, jumping jacks, things like that. Build up a little sweat, then stretch. You shouldn't stretch immediately. You want to warm up that system and stretch. The support of all your joints really are through muscles. And knees, uh, really specifically, if you have achy knees and, and it's not something terribly wrong but really bothersome, if you do exercises, and uh, one would be just you know, gentle bicycling, and then what we call leg extension, starting with uh, flex knee and going up, and then do that with weights. And, and then there are others. If you just, or leg uh, presses, you're pushing against weights. If you do that, um, after a while, there's no question that you'll feel better.